many sons and daughters do we have in this place? Lift your hands right now and thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God that he doesn't just call you friend, but he calls you son. He calls you daughter. Hallelujah. You belong to the family of God because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a big shout this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What an awesome, awesome morning. I was so excited to come to church this morning. Aren't you glad you go to a church where you can be excited? I'm just excited to be here. Excited to be in his presence. Excited to be with you all. Amen. And I just know that uh, it's been so good here already this morning. You can just sense the presence of God. Anytime there's honor, you know, there's something parallel to heaven where the presence of God is just kind of recognized in a greater way. And you can just sense it in here this morning. You can cut it with a knife. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's real. And there's times like this where it's tangible. Amen. And today as you hear the word, being that it's so tangible, just just receive whatever it is that you need. God's going to speak to you in a real special way. Amen. So just hear with ears to hear. See with eyes to see. It's going to be good. And, and you know, it's a, it's a little later start time for me than normal. But don't worry about the clock. Amen. If the anointing lifts in 10 minutes, then we'll be done. Right? <laughs> but if it lifts in two hours, then we'll be done. I just got done being around Kenneth Copeland, so it could be for two, three hours. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. It's just so, so good to be here this morning with y'all. Amen. Did you bring your Bibles with you this morning? Amen. If you brought your Bibles, I want you to turn with me where we left off from last week to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. We've been talking about grace-based success, or you could title it grace-based prosperity. Now, when we talk about the word prosperity, a lot of people think money in terms of money, and that is true, but it's not all inclusive of what prosperity really is. And so you really limit yourself if you just think about money when it comes to prosperity. But we know, for time's sake, we won't review, but we know that when we see the word prosperity, really what it's talking about is success in every way. Success in every way. And God wants us, and it is, let me just say this, this is the will of God. Say that with me. Say, this is the will of God. For me to have success in every way. Amen. In fact, one translation of 3 John, verse 2, is, Beloved, I wish above all that you would have, you know, in the King James, it says, prosper. But in the Amplified, I believe it says that you would have success in every way. In every way. And then he says spirit, soul, and body. And so success in our spirit is when you got born again. When I got born again, I got prosperity in my spirit. So it's there. That's, that's powerful thought to think that all of the kingdom of heaven, all of the grace of God, all of the goodness of God resides already on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So prospering spiritually would be being born again. Prospering financially, praise God, would be, would be basically being blessed you know, in, in the arena of finances. And that's good too. And I believe it is the will of God for everybody in the body of Christ. Everybody. It's not just people in this church, but yet I'm talking to you today. But it's the will of God for everybody to, to financially prosper. Being broke does not give glory to God. If, if You know, I've, one time one person said, I, I'm tired of you talking about prosperity so much. So I just got mad at hearing that when I first started. I, I was ticked off because people are in such bondage, you know, they don't want to hear about prosperity. We, we don't want to hear about prosperity. So I said, fine. I said, I'm going to teach you how to be poor for the next four weeks. And I did. I did. I don't know if any of you are in here, but I taught a message called How to Be Poor and How to Be Real Good at It. Because really, you don't want to be poor, I guarantee you. If you do, just quit your job. That was one of my points. Just quit your job today. That, that's step one. That's a powerful point there. If you want to be poor, stop working. You know, it's a spiritual thing. It's really a spiritual thing. But... 
that, that, you know, people get so hung up on, you know, hearing about prosperity, but prosperity is a grace. It's a grace. The Bible says that he became poor so that we might be rich. And that's not talking about being poor spiritually. That's including all types of poverty, but it also includes being poor financially. Amen. And so we must realize that prosperity financially is a grace from God. God wants you to have a full supply. Amen. Don't, don't shout me down too, too much because I know some of you would like me to preach on how to be poor. One of my points was if you want to be poor and real good at it, then keep your Christmas lights up for one whole year straight because that's what lazy people do. They don't take it down. <laughs> well, that's the truth, isn't it? They got a reindeer on the roof that's kind of... <laughs> the wind's blowing. The reindeer's been up there for a year. Poor Rudolph. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> I feel sorry for Rudolph. You know, they bought him at Walmart, and now he's just in a poverty house. He'll never be the same. You know why? Because he's weathered. It's no longer Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's pink. His nose is pink because it's, sun, it's weathered by the sun. <laughs> you know how to be poor, how to be real good at it. Just don't change your oil for thousands and thousands and thousands of miles and don't clean your car. Just neglect everything. And, you know, the Bible does have a lot to say about that. And you say, well, that has to do with my effort. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort to be poor. <laughs> and so after hearing that for week after week and week after week, I had someone come and say, could you just preach on prosperity? <laughs> Again, could you just talk about the grace of prosperity? I said, yeah, but see, people get so hung up on prosperity because they attribute it to finances, but yet you still have to stop there because Jesus died for your freedom from lack. Hallelujah. He does, he does not, he, it, 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 let me say it this way, it is not the will of God for you to be broke another day again in your life. Ever, ever, ever broke. And if you'll, Keep, if you'll walk with God in that sense of just communing with Him, fellowshipping with Him, He'll point out things in your life that have a spirit of poverty on it, and you'll be like, okay, that's not who I am, and I'll make that adjustment. I'll take Rudolph off the roof. Okay, so I don't know if that helps you. I didn't plan on talking about that, but in my review, certain things might come out. God does not want you poor no more. Hallelujah. And so if you get a hold of that, and I believe in these last days we really, we really should, especially with some things that go on in our economy, just the waves. We have a wave, a season of prosperity, then we have recession. And then we have all these things going on in the economy and stock market. And people think because we're in a recession, we have to have a cheap spirit. And then, then we get that over in the church. And I've, I've heard a cheap spirit in the church before. I heard it with Judas. Remember, Judas was watching that lady's pouring the ointment over Jesus' feet, and he's just blessing him. And he's thinking, oh my, we could just save that. We could sell it, and we could give it to the poor. But he didn't really want to sell it and give it to the poor. He was thinking, I could have that for me because I've been stealing the coins. Out, all these, this, because see, that's a wrong spirit in the church. And really, what that lady was doing was blessing Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? And people get have a problem with the things of God having a blessing on it. We gotta have, we gotta be cheap with the things of God. No, no, no. The church deserves the best. The church deserves the best. Hallelujah. We should have the best parking lots. We should have the best fencing around the church. We should have the best camera equipment. That's going to cost money. You, the, the reason why you talk like that is because to you, money's an object. But to God, money's a very small thing. Why am I talking about this right now? Where are you at, Judas?
you want to really be careful because it, that, that will get in you, and it's just really, it's a, it's a magnet of, pro, of poverty. You can be a magnet for poverty, or you could be a magnet to prosperity. Now, let me say this. I didn't plan on saying any of this, but money attracts to people like people attract to people. Money was attracted to Jesus. You know how I know? There were three wise men that were carrying some stuff that were trying to find him and were led by the Spirit to where he was at. And they were carrying things. Hallelujah. They were carrying things that had some value to it that were there to bless him. Hallelujah. Money was attracted to Jesus. Don't shout me down. I know I'm going a little bit different direction. But you can get to the place where money's attracted to you. But you have to, you have to get rid of a cheap spirit. Cheap, broke, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer ain't coming down spirit. Because if you're like that, then poverty will magnetize towards you. It'll be attracted to you the same way. But I don't know about you, I, I got Jesus with me. I'm walking with him, amen? And if I'm walking with him, I'm walking with the greatest magnet of prosperity, hallelujah, who even when he was a baby, hallelujah, had some wise men that were carrying some valuable things that were attracted to him just to lavish him with it. Now, if I'm with Jesus and Jesus is with me, then the same kind of prosperity that's attracted to him, hallelujah, it's attracted to me too. And I have a right to it because I'm one with him. But religion gets us all tied up in knots when we hear this. Because really we have a wrong perception of it. We have a wrong idea of it. And I heard a statement, and I, I, was, I was telling the family this last night, is, is this, it's really good, is that money will amplify whatever's in you. Money will amplify what's in you. And if you have a wrong heart towards something, it probably is not a good idea for you to have money because it's going to amplify what's on the inside of you. It does. Have you ever noticed that... I didn't plan on going this way. I hope this is helping you today. Have you ever noticed that there's always people that say, when my ship comes in, Pastor, when my ship... I had an individual one time, he said, when my ship comes in, and he literally, his ship came in in the form of a yacht. He said, when my ship comes in, I'm going to really bless the church. But what, what that ship did was it really amplified what was really in his heart. I found out that you can't go by what people say. People say, I, I got your back, Pastor. I'm behind you. Yeah, I know you are. You're way back there. I'm not moved by what you say. I'm really not moved by what people say. I don't let it get me all excited and stuff like that because I've been told my ship's coming in, Pastor, and I don't get my hope tied to that. My hope is not tied to stuff. My anchor is fixed with Jesus. It's not what you have. It's who you're with. Okay? It is not what you have that determines you to be a successful or prosperous person. It is who you're with. Hallelujah. That makes you a prosperous person. Amen. And so I've had people say, you know, behind you, I got your back. And I don't put a lot of weight to that. Because people come and go. They do. There's, there's a, there is a tram in some churches that just goes and goes. It's like Disneyland, a tram. It'll drop you off at all kinds of places. And it seems like there's a tram in Hemet and it drops you from one church to the next. And some people are on that tram. And I get that. I, I, I get that. And ultimately, I just have to pray for you because really the blessing is where people are planted. Are planted. There's, there's a planting of the Lord. And when you're planted in the house of God, the Bible says you'll flourish. You really want to know one of the steps to prosperity and success is to get yourself planted in a local church. Get off the get off the tram that drops you off at the the haunted house. And the, get off the monorail, okay, and get planted in the house of the Lord. 
And that really will help you build and develop character so that when money increases, it amplifies good things in you. It, it, because whatever's in you will be amplified by money. True. True. People serve money. Not just people that have a lot of money, but people that have no money still serve money. You will serve the one that you listen to and obey. And money tells people what to do all the time. Tells you what you can do, what you can't do, what you can buy, what you can't buy, what, where you can go, where you can't go. And I've just made a point that when it comes to this church, even if recession comes, we're going to give the devil a black eye and we're just going to trust in the grace of his prosperity and know that he takes care of us in whatever season. I'm not going to pinch and cut and, and be cheap, but I'm going to just get, if it has to come to this point, I will on purpose get the most expensive thing just to give the devil, the cheap devil a black eye. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Well, you think you should use the Lord's money like that? Well, okay, that's what Judas was saying. So, you've got to understand this, and that's not a put down, I mean, and I don't know anyone that said that, I'm just saying. I've felt that way before too, because a lot of times when circumstances come, you get carnal. You look at the circumstances and think, okay, Okay, I've got to be moved by what I see. But if you, if you understand prosperity the way God does, you'll look at money and say, this is not an object, this is a tool. This is a tool. How did I get over on this? Well, because we need to hear this. Okay, let's say recession comes, which has come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. You know, really the, the word recession means to return back to the original owner, that which was lost. That's really what the word recession means, to return back to the original owner, that which was lost. And let me tell you something, there may come another time when it hits and you have all these people with all this money that are being hit and they, go, they lose everything. And guess what? That is an opportunity for those that believe in an end time transfer. Come on. For the wealth of the wicked to be transferred to the hands of who it really belongs to. And you know where it's going to go? It's going to go where it's attracted. It'll go to whom it's attracted to. And it won't be attracted to a spirit of poverty. And if you don't like what I'm saying, then, then just go to the bathroom for a few minutes. <laughs> and that's okay if you don't like it. Just sit here. Sit here long enough so you can see it in the Word and you can have it bear witness in your spirit. And maybe you'll get mad enough and you'll realize, what, the, what in the world am I doing still being poor when Jesus went to the cross 2,000 years ago and died and became poor for me to be rich? Then let your faith reach back over 2,000 years ago to where he did that and appropriate God's goodness and his grace to your life and start walking in that. And I promise you, I promise you that there'll be some development and prosperity that goes on in your soul. You'll think different. You'll talk different, and right believing will be, a, will be because of right thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And some, some of us, we have traditional way of thinking, and that tradition needs to go out the window, and we've got to start thinking in line with the Word of God and realize Jesus is not broke. If Jesus ain't broke, then I'm not broke. Jesus is not sick. If Jesus ain't sick, then I'm not sick. Well, you, well, and the devil said on your shoulder, you sure look sick, you sure look broke, you sure look defeated. It's not according to how you look, it's not according to what you have, it's determined by who's with you, hallelujah, and if God be with you, then who can be against you? The Bible says, as he is in this world, then so am I. How is, how is he right now? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, he's not sick, he's not broke, he's not dead, he's not defeated, depressed. He is full of joy. Hallelujah. He's in a position of authority. As he is, so are we right now in this world. That's what the Bible says. As he is. As he is. As he is. Now, if you want to find out how you should be in this world, find out how he is. And as he is, that's your position. That's your place. And you're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk it out. Hallelujah. How do I walk it out? By faith. 
By faith, I look into the perfect law of liberty. I look into that mirror. I believe I am who he says I am. I believe I can do what he says I can do. I believe I can have what he says I can have. I walk it out. I talk it out. Hallelujah. I say it with my faith. Hallelujah. And I start acting like it's so. Amen. I don't believe I'm healed just because my body says I'm healed. I don't believe I'm blessed financially just because my my finances say I'm blessed financially. I believe it because the Word says, the Word says, the Word says, the Word says, it is written. you got to find out what's written in the book and apply that to your life and believe what you see and start walking that out. And I promise you, hallelujah, it will not only... It, it be uh, manifest on the outside, but it will grow so big on the inside that it'll change the way you think. You'll start looking at things and you'll think, I don't like that. That's, that's, Christ didn't die, die for me to live that way. And you'll, you'll start saying, I, I'm, I'm going to look into the mirror and I'm going to adjust my words, my thoughts, my actions to what I see how He is. Because as He is, so am I in this world. Amen. Are you, are, you getting, are you following what I'm saying today? How is he? He's blessed. He's successful in every way. He succeeded over death. He succeeded over hell. He succeeded over the grave. He succeeded over sickness. He even succeeded over poverty and lack. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? And the more knowledge you have of that, the more understanding you have of that, the more you'll have grace and peace being multiplied to your life. We're talking about grace-based success. Grace-based success comes through proper knowledge. Now look here in our text. Are you there? I bet you thought I'd never get to it. In, in the Amplified, I don't know if, Y'all can put that up in the Amplified for me on there so they can read it, but I'm going to read to you out of the Amplified. It says grace and peace. Everybody say grace and peace. Grace and peace. I love that. That same sense of spiritual well-being be multiplied to you in the true, intimate knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now your King James says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge. But that's not talking about knowledge of God. If you look at it in the original, you'll find out it's talking about knowledge from God. In fact, it's talking about precise, very particular knowledge from God. Do you know that hand in hand with God, you can walk with God and he can give you particulars about something? It's one thing to know the scripture, and I believe it still applies to having an understanding of what the Bible says about you and about the grace of God that's in you. But it's another thing to have grace speak to you and tell you particulars about certain things. And you walk in those things and it causes grace to be multiplied in areas of your life. Amen. Now, turn with me. <laughs> this is good. This is going to be really, really good. If I can just get through these scriptures here today, it'll really bless you. Go to Luke chapter 5. Let's talk about this precise knowledge. While you're turning there, I'll finish reading this. It says, grace be multiplied, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, understand that the word knowledge there has a twofold meaning. It's not just a knowing, but it also means to acknowledge, to acknowledge something. In other words, I acknowledge God that's you. I acknowledge God that you're with me. You understand what I'm saying? It comes from the same word knowledge for me to have a vivid sense of knowing in my heart that that was God in this situation. Now, let me just say this. The more you acknowledge that God and his grace did something for you, the more that grace will multiply in your life. Isn't that good? The more I acknowledge, okay, God, even though what was said went against my flesh, 
that's grace revealing that to me. I acknowledge that. That's your goodness that's taking me out of the pit. Even divine instruction from heaven, precise knowledge, is the grace of God. It's unmerited, undeserved favor from God. When, when he gives you instruction, you didn't deserve that. You didn't work for that. You didn't read for that. That's God speaking to you. That's his unmerited, undeserved, favorable instruction to lead you, some, I almost said it, to your happy place or to your wealthy place, but to your grace place. To a place of favor, to a place of, wow, I landed here. How did I get here? All he did was tell me to do something. It made no sense, but it was precise knowledge from heaven that now multiplied grace to my life. Isn't that good? I mean, how'd you like God to give you some precision in your knowing and say, okay, what I want you to do is wake up at six o'clock this morning and go to the corner and someone's going to be waiting for you and they're going to hand you a paper bag and in that paper bag is going to be all that you need to pay your bills. Boy, that'd be powerful. Huh? How, how many like precision like that? Yeah. You know God can talk to you like that, and you know that paper sack of money to pay your bills, you didn't deserve that, you didn't earn that, you didn't work for that, you didn't work eight hours for that. That was God giving you favorable instruction, which is grace instruction, to get you to the corner where the paper sack was. And the paper sack was grace. Everything's grace. It's grace upon grace. You didn't deserve it, but it's a gift from God. And do you know that the more you acknowledge those things, the more, the, the more grace is multiplied to you. The problem that we have is people want to take credit for everything and say, I earned it. Even religious people will say, I earned this because I prayed. I earned this because I prayed and the heavens fell. Notice it's always the heavens fell, the angels showed up, the visitations came, God spoke to me in an audible voice, but I fasted. And there's always a, a tie to their obedience. And when your obedience is magnified, no longer will His grace be multipli multiplied in those areas. And that's what religion does, is they put the spotlight on what they do instead of what he has already done. I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm giving you a little bit of instruction. I mean, it's, it, this is good stuff. And you begin to put the spotlight on, wow, that was grace. That was the goodness of God. Now, let me tell you something. When you're walking with God and talking with him and just fellowshipping with him, what he does is he gives you precise knowledge and he'll tell you some things that will go against your flesh and you'll think, well, how's that going to happen? And you've got to get your head out of the way and obey faith. That's where the Bible talks about the obedience of faith. It's basically you taking your faith saying, I'm going to trust what you're saying is going to lead me to that place instead of trusting in my flesh trusting in what I can do or trusting what I have done, I'm going to trust in this divine favor of instruction that you've given me that will lead me to multiplied grace. Isn't that good? Now look here at Luke chapter 5. I might just give you one scripture, but this is so good. Luke chapter 5, and we've heard this before, but faith don't come by heard. Does it? Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing, look what he says, and it came to pass, verse 1, as the people pressed upon him, Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets, right? So understand that if they were washing their nets, they weren't listening. They're, they're still working, right? And you, and you got to understand that Jesus was wanting to tell them something, give them instruction. But when you're in a place of working instead of resting, you'll have a hard time listening. You can apply that to what we're talking about because when you're working, God's not doing anything. But when you're resting, God can now work on your behalf. 
Now, when God wants to give you precise knowledge about something, you better not be washing your nets. You better be listening. Now, this is an area where I have to really learn as well as you that we got to settle ourselves down sometimes and get in a quiet place, a place of rest so God can speak to us and give us grace knowledge. Knowledge that you didn't get from your education or you didn't earn or you don't know about, but God knows some divine instruction to pass your way to help you out. Understand, they're cleaning their nets because they've been fishing all night. They didn't catch anything. They're discouraged. They're not happy. They've been working, and they still didn't get anything. And how many know when you're working, and you're not getting anything, and you're working off commission, you're working off the fish that you catch, and the fish that you sell after you catch it, and you don't catch anything, and you're washing your nets, you're pretty discouraged. So you've got to understand, these people were not happy. They were washing their nets, and Jesus said, just to paraphrase, you can read your scripture. You can read it's true. Jesus said, I want to borrow your boats. I want to thrust out. Hallelujah, into the land. I want to teach from your boat. But they're still washing their nets. And Jesus says, let down, here it is. Here it is. Here's precise knowledge, right? He says, let down your nets. Nets. Plural, right? And we know that they let down one net. How many of you know, when God tells you to do something, he's very precise about it, and there's grace on that. There was multiplied grace that came from that word that was bigger than one net. In fact, it was, I don't know how it happened, but they filled their boats. They filled their boats with fish. And to fill it, you would have had to have nets to do it, but their nets broke. So grace will do for you what your occupation and your nets can't do. Grace had to have had those fish just jump into the boat. Right? And Peter's thinking, I've tried that, I've done that, I, we, we tried to deserve it, we tried to earn it, it didn't work. Jesus said, okay, if you'll do what I'm telling you through knowledge, I'll multiply grace unto you. And even through his mercy, when the net broke, man, the boats were still filled with fish. And then he fell to his feet and repented and said, I'm a sinful man. Why? Because he, because he believed small. Right? Yeah, are you following what I'm saying? The cool thing is, is what grace did for him <laughs> through the knowledge. See that? Grace through the knowledge. Grace through the knowledge. Multiplied grace. How? Through the knowledge. Now, think about this. There were so much fish. Jesus not only took care of them, paid for them, but it paid for the ministry. They went ahead and quit their occupation <laughs> and followed him. And uh, Jesus knew how to take an offering for the ministry because it took care of the ministry as well. Oh, glory to God. Are you listening to me? And they changed their occupation. They quit trusting in their nets and started trusting in the one who could cause the fish to leap into their boat. God wants to get you to, to a place of supernatural increase where it doesn't come through your net. It comes through them jumping into your boat. Oh, my gosh. Are you listening to me? I never thought about that. I mean, all of us have nets, and we're supposed to have nets. And, and he says, if you don't work, you don't eat, right? So there's nothing wrong with having nets. There's nothing wrong with having a business or a job. You should. He's, in fact, the scripture says in Ephesians, let him that stole steal no more, but let him work. In other words, if you're not working, you're a thief. You're actually robbing yourself. He says, let him that stole steal no more, but let him work. That should, be, that should be a grace instruction for someone. Said, let them work. Why? Work for you? No. Work so that he might have seed to sow. So that he may give. And then you get to live off what comes from the harvest of giving. See, but we got it backwards because we're working for a living instead of working for sowing. And sowing is a grace activity, right? And working is a flesh activity. But God doesn't want you just to benefit from your 
working in the natural, he wants to gracefully add to you or supernaturally add to you to where the fish are jumping in your boat. Hallelujah. He wants to get you to the place where you're no longer fishing with those nets no more, but you're following grace. Hallelujah. And see what happens when prosperity is jumping in your boat? You now have a revelation that that prosperity is not for you. It's for you to be a fisher of men. Hallelujah. It's a whole other message. Y'all see that? Now, let me give you another scripture. Go here to John uh, chapter 21. Let me give you another fishing story. (laughs) How many like fishing stories? Can I have like five more minutes? Is that all right? I promise you that your restaurant will be open. In fact, everybody that was there, they'll be gone. The place will be empty. You'll have it all yourself. (laughs) The food will be fresher. Everything's good. Verse 5. Page 132. Hurry up, Pastor. Shut up. I'm hungry. (laughs) Jesus saith unto them, Children, do you have any meat? He answered them, he said, No. And he said unto them, Cast thy net. How many nets? One. But this time, I think they're going to do what he says. Because last time they weren't so sure because they were so prone to just believe in their occupation and their self-effort, and their performance, and it didn't work for them. And they thought, well, how can grace supply it? But I'm going to tell you something, grace can. And grace oftentimes comes through knowledge, and so don't disregard when God speaks to you and tells you to do something, even when it don't make sense to you. It can bring bring you to a place where you are so in awe, and you have to just go and tell what God did for you. And you won't be excited to say, it's because I obeyed him. I heard from him. I obeyed him. And look what happened. No, no, no. It won't be because you obeyed him. It'll be because you were in faith. Yeah, it was the obedience of faith. But you'll be in, so, you'll be in such amazement of God's grace that you will bring attention to the fact, I didn't earn this. I didn't deserve this. There's nothing I did to get it. But it came because of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. And he gave me his unmerited favor. And he spoke to me. Not only did he die for me, but now he lives on the inside of me. And he gives me precise knowledge. And he tells me about normal things in my life so he can add to my life. And you know, there's times where grace will come in packages that you don't understand. He can give you a warning. That's grace. He can give you a dream and tell you not to go to a certain place. Or be with a certain person, that's grace. He can give you a prophecy, that's grace. And it may go totally, you know, Hezekiah got a prophecy and he said, turn your face to the wall. Get your house in order, you're going to die. That was grace and he was, able to, he was able to turn that and add years to his life. That was grace that got him turned in the right direction. Understand that all of those things, instruction from God, precise knowledge, intimate knowledge, that's grace. And if you'll, if you'll just obey it by faith, in other, words, the, in other words, the obedience of faith, and you'll walk in that grace, I promise you that it'll multiply peace in your life. Because there's no peace going against the warnings of God. There's no peace going against the wisdom of God. There's no grace for you outside of the lane that God has for you. You need to make sure that you're in the grace lane. See, and I'm going to talk about this later on, but the Lord's starting to minister to me the difference between self-effort and belief effort. Self-effort versus belief effort. We're not to work or operate in the mode of self-effort, but there are some of us that have to have some belief effort. We've got to labor, the Bible says, therefore, to enter into his rest. There are certain things that you have to do. There's efforts. You're making an effort today to sit under the word of God, to, to, to have knowledge. And some of you are so hungry right now, you're mad at me, but you're still making an effort to sit here and hear. Hearing sometimes an effort. You understand what I'm saying? It's an effort. Coming to church sometimes, it's an effort. Okay? But it is not an effort to, 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 to manipulate the hand of God 
to do something on your behalf. Jesus did all those efforts. This is just an effort to tweak your thinking, to think in line with the Word of God, because the way you think is the way you believe. It'll affect what you believe. And what you believe, your belief about something, will affect what you have in life. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And sometimes we've got to slap ourselves, we've got to wash our minds with the water of the Word of God to get our mind renewed to truth. It takes an effort to give the devil a black eye and tell him, shut up, you're not going to talk to me like that because that's not who I am. It does. It takes an effort to grab him by the nap of the neck and say, you're not going to call me broke, you're not going to call me sick, I'll never be sick another day again in my life, and to talk to yourself and write on the tables of your heart what you believe. And to speak it out of your mouth. The Bible says, labor, therefore, to enter into this place of rest. Yeah, that's it's an oxymoron, but there's, there's a sense of labor to enter into rest. And it's belief effort. We're fighting against something. We're fighting against the tide out there in the spirit of this world that's trying to form the way you believe. Mind renewal is not a one-time event. It's a constant thing that we do and that's where the scripture comes to our text again third john says, beloved i wish above, above all that above all that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers that's your part is to be sure that you're doing whatever it takes for your soul to prosper because whatever happens between the ears is what's going to affect your belief this is so good. I know some of you are looking at me saying, <laughs> but I, I, do you want to stay broke? You want to stay sick? No. So you got to change the way you think. That takes an effort. Okay? We don't have to go to the cross. He did that. That work's already been done. Price has already been paid. There's no self-effort to try to get God to do something. But we want to make sure that our mind's renewed to truth because, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, it says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. you got to guard between the ears, between the eyes and the mouth. It takes an effort to guard that. If the scripture tells us to guard, that's work. But that's not work for salvation. That's not, it's salvation's ours. It's in us. Y'all get this. Okay, let me read this last scripture to you. It says, then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? Then answered him, No. They answered him, No. Let me get my glasses on because I said them and it says they. <laughs> them answered him, No. <laughs> and he saith unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. And you shall find. And they cast therefore. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. What's that? That's multiplication. That's divine instruction. That's grace. I like to call it grace instruction. It's, it's instruction that you're graced with because he loves you. He's telling you secrets concerning your fishing trip. You want to be like everybody else? They're using the green bait. But if you use the orange bait, everybody's going to look at you and say, how are you doing it? But I'm telling you that it's the orange bait. How'd you like God to tell you that? And all of a sudden, everybody's been fishing there all day long. It's not even time to fish. But you got the orange bait, and he told you what size hook to have. You got a different size leader than everybody else. But you throw your line out there, and just one after another, you're catching it. What is that? That's not you. You didn't even know that it was orange. You didn't even know what size hook. It originated with favorable instruction from God, and then he multiplied fish coming into your life. That's what happened right here. Do you know God loves you? And that he favors you so much that if you'll talk with him, if you'll actually slow your life down, put your phone down. <laughs> Quit texting Get off social media. The green light's on too long next to your name. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes you got to slow down and let him talk to you. He's not going to talk to you tell much, tell you how much he's mad at you. Kathleen, I'm so mad at you. Could you imagine? That's not God. He want, doesn't want to do that to you. He wants to say, Kathleen, 6 a.m., I got something around the corner. Just show up. They're coming your way. They're going to bless you. Maybe. I don't know. But if you just talk to them, If you'll just listen to him, come on, somebody. This means i got to actually be a Christian and walk with God, talk with God, that whatever happens don't just happen. Now i got to have communion with him. That's not a struggle. That's not a chore. That's a blessing to know that he's with me. His grace is with me to give me knowledge, to take me to a place of multiplication. You understand that? You'll understand success. You understand that? You'll understand grace-based success in every area of your life. Notice I'm clapping to the beat of my words. He's trying to do it with me. You know, success in your marriage is peace. Right? Success in your marriage is peace. You know, uh, the Lord spoke to me. He said, next time you go on a date with your wife, this is what he told me. Now, this is, I, I'm going to have multiplications on this. Somehow, grace is going to multiply some peace in my marriage. He, next time you go on a date, leave your phone in the car. And I told her about it. I said, Lord told me to leave my phone in the car and give you my undivided attention. Right. Now, you know that God will give you. For 26 years, through self-effort, I have tried to increase and multiply some blessing into my life from her. But now knowledge is going to multiply it. <laughs> you know, God can do that for you in your marriage, on the job. You get what I'm saying. I just being a little bit funny, but <laughs> at the same time, it's true. Same time, it's true. Because the Lord is working on me on, on just being a listener. Because my mind's going 20 miles, 20 hundred miles, 20 thousand hundred miles. Is that a number? It's a big number. <laughs> but if we'll slow ourselves down, we can hear some things. And you know that God is just so powerful to all you male chauvinists out there. Because there's a lot of them. I ain't going to do anything she says. Well, divine knowledge can come through her mouth if you just listen. And you'll have some multiplication in a lot of different areas <laughs> that have been like a drought in your marriage. And that's, that's the God's honest truth, that sometimes God will speak through your spouse if you just sit there and listen, you dummy. I love you, but I mean, we're just dumb sometimes, right? And we just, well, I'm a man. and it, well, No, 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 he's the man. And if he wants to use his grace-based knowledge through anybody, he can. Even a donkey. Right? All right, y'all get something out of that? I'm going to stop. Your wife's not a donkey. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stop. I'm stopping now. It's time to. It's time to stop. <laughs> Where's that shovel? Here, Lamont. Take Pastor Lamont. Take my shovel from me. Don't you love him? Amen. Aren't you thankful for him? Aren't you thankful that he? You know. I tell you what. You don't have to try to get God to be with you. When you're born again, he's with you. Genesis 39 and the Amplified said, Joseph, although he was a slave, although that's what it says in the Amplified, he words it just like that. Genesis 39, verse 2. Joseph, although he was a slave, God was with him and he was a prosperous man. So I don't care what position or situation you're in right now. Your success is not based on your position or situation, it's based on who's with you. And the same one that's with you 
is the same one that told them what side of the boat to throw their net on. He's the same one that told Peter to go fishing, and the first fish that you catch is going to be coined in its mouth to pay my taxes and yours. That's precise knowledge. Will God do that for you? Yes. Why? He loves you. He loves you so much that prior to you earning or deserving him to be connected to you and in you, he died for you while you were a sinner. He loved you while you were a sinner. And when you got born again, he gave you his righteousness so that there could be a pure vessel for a pure God to live in and talk to you because God will not be unequally yoked. You couldn't make yourself equally yoked with him through your efforts, so he made you clean through his blood and through his righteousness so that a righteous God could come in. And now you're qualified for him to talk to you and give you precision. You're qualified. You're qualified. You don't have to qualify yourself by going to Sunday school faithfully, giving faith, all these things. You're already qualified if you're born again. Quit spotlighting your faithfulness. Spotlight his it's his faithfulness that qualifies us and makes us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of life. Hallelujah. Put your hands together.